folklore, the beliefs, traditions, and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. At the start of the world, according to some Native American tribal mythology, fire was owned by Bear. Bear and his people took fire with them whenever they went on their travels, using it for light and for warmth. On one occasion, Bear and his tribe found a forest covered in acorns. The acorns were ripe and tasty. Bear and his people set down fire at the edge of the forest and began to eat the acorns, moving further into the forest as they ate and collected. Fire burned happily on the edge of the forest until it had consumed almost all of its fuel, whereupon it grew smaller and began to die. Feed me! shouted Fire to Bear in a panic but Bear and the tribe had moved too far away in their search for more and more acorns, and did not hear fire. Just as fire was close to death, man walked through the forest. Feed me! shouted fire in desperation to man. Man, who had not seen fire before, asked what fire would eat. Fire explained that it ate wood, and so man laid a stick on the north side of fire. As the stick began to burn, man laid another on the south side, and then on the east and west, until fire burned brightly. Man sat with fire, and continued to feed it whenever it was hungry. After a long time passed, Bear and his tribe returned to the edge of the forest. Fire was very angry with Bear, and flared so brightly that Bear had to shield his eyes with his paws. I do not even know you, shouted Fire, and drove Bear and the others away with a ferocious heat. Fire now belonged to man. I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and writer. Welcome to the Folklore Podcast, Show 8, Out of the Ashes. Fire can indeed be a powerful and sometimes all-consuming force. Helpful and dangerous in equal measure, the ability to use fire sets man apart from the animals. It should not be too surprising, then, that fire features heavily in our folklore and traditions. There are many stories from native peoples in similar vein to that of bear and fire with which this episode opened. Often, fire and life are intrinsically linked. The Shawnee people, for example, say that both come from the same place. In other stories, which parallel the Christian story of the Great Flood, fire purges the earth of all the evil people. One tells of a man who walks to a place where the earth and sky meet. 
Here he watches the grass begin to burn, the fire spreading until all the world is on fire. Only those people pure of heart survive. They are left on a desolate, charred earth until the water maiden brings a basket of water with which she restores life. It is interesting that in the Christian parable water destroys life, whereas here it restores it. In the Christian stories, as in many others of course, fires burn strongly in hell. These differences in good and evil representation may be found in other places too. There is much folklore, for example, linking fire to mythical creatures. In some, these may be good, and in others, they may bring evil. Russian Slavic folklore tells of a creature called the firebird, which represents the good side and brings fortune to those who own it, in the main. The firebird is traditionally a relatively large creature with plumage which glows the colours of fire, red, orange and yellow. Even when plucked, the feathers continue to glow to such an extent that a single one may light a room if it is not covered. We may see some parallels with other birds, of course. The obvious icon which comes to mind first when thinking of the firebird is the phoenix, the mythical bird that rises from the ashes of its own destruction. But more interestingly, over time, representations of the firebird in art have changed, such that the creature is now often portrayed as being much smaller, with a crest on its head and glowing eyes on its tail feathers. Very much a flammable peacock. In folk tales, the firebird is often found as the object of a quest. These stories may be quite formulaic, as fairy tales often are, with the feather highlighting a future difficult journey to find the bird as a prize at the end. This idea is paralleled in the folklore of other countries, such as Iran, Armenia and Czechoslovakia. The Brothers Grimm published a fairy tale called The Golden Bird about a similar creature. We even find a parallel in the British comedy film Carry On Up the Jungle, part of a famous stable of seaside postcard humour style comedies in the form of a quest for the Ooslem bird, which is exceedingly rare because of its habit of flying round in circles until it disappears up its own... Well, you get the idea. With the case of a very real creature, the salamander, folkloric fire aspects are mapped onto the actual animal. One strain of the genus is, after all, called the fire salamander. Probably one of the earliest physical descriptions of the actual salamander comes from Pliny the Elder, who says that it is an animal, like a lizard in shape and with a body, starred all over. He also accurately describes aspects of its behaviour, but then goes on to discuss some less plausible aspects, such as its ability to extinguish fire with its body and its poisonous properties which, although based in fact, are wildly exaggerated. The Talmud is a large collection of Jewish laws and doctrines written prior to the 8th century by Jewish teachers. Within these writings, the salamander is described as a creature which is a product of fire itself, and further suggests that smearing yourself in the blood of the salamander will render you impervious to harm from fire. Within early Christian writings, St. Augustine uses the fire legends of the salamander to offer a warning of the very real possibility of being burned by eternal flame in purgatory for being a sinner. Moving into medieval times, we see many depictions of the salamander drawing on aspects of fire law within European medieval bestiaries. In these illustrations, the creature often has parallels with a satyr or a worm passing through fire. Moving into the Renaissance period, the examples tend to be more realistic and more representative of Pliny's original description of a lizard-like animal. Although the salamander has many interesting traits, aspects of its behaviour relating to fire have become the most entrenched in folklore. Why might this be? One argument suggests that the stories come from the hibernation habits of the animal, often choosing rotten logs to bed down underneath or inside of. 
In times where open fires were the norm, the animals would therefore emerge from the wood on the fire when the logs were tossed in, an occurrence no doubt as fantastic looking as a phoenix rising from the ashes. Many similarities exist between the salamander as an actual creature and the dragon as a mythological one. These we will pass over for now, as we'll revisit the theme of dragons in a future edition of the Folklore Podcast. Returning briefly to the Talmud, we find a description by the scribe Rashi, which suggests that the salamander as a creature was produced by burning a fire in the same place for a period of seven years. Seven, of course, is an important number within folklore for many and varied reasons. Moving away from animals, we may also find interesting folklore relating to burning fires and hearths. The hearth, of course, was the centre of the home, used for cooking and for warmth. It is a place of significant importance to witches, and we will return to fire and magic shortly. I live on the edge of Dartmoor, an expanse of wild and often very remote moorland in the southwest of the United Kingdom. High on the moor sits the Warren House Inn, which reports to be one of the highest inns above sea level in the country. Despite the fact that the inn used to be situated on the opposite side of the road before being demolished when a new building was raised, the fire is said to have burned in the grate continuously since 1845. The fire was transferred to the new building, it is said, by carrying the glowing embers from the old building to the new. The eternal fire is certainly very well known. Postcards and souvenirs have been produced relating to it. Sadly, as you would expect, the story is certainly apocryphal. Within very recent memory, the fire has most certainly been extinguished in front of an eyewitness by using a method not altogether savoury after an evening's drinking. As you would expect, the Warren House is not the only pub which has a story relating to a fire which has never been, or must never be, extinguished. A similar tale was told of the Salters Gate Inn at Levisham in North Yorkshire. Here it was said that the fire must be kept burning in order to avoid catastrophe following from a curse which related to the inn's history of smuggling. The landlord of the pub in the 16th century was a retired sea captain and was happy for smugglers to use his inn to help the locals to avoid high taxation. One night a raid was made by the local customs men. Although they found nothing, one of them stayed behind in an effort to lay a trap, but was caught and killed. His body, says the story, was buried under the fireplace, and the landlord decreed that the fire must never be allowed to go out, because nobody would search under a burning grate. Thirty years later, the landlord has died, but the tradition is embedded and continues. As with much folklore, of course, the legend also becomes embellished, and so, instead of burning to hide the evidence, the story develops such that allowing the fire to die will result in the spirit of the murdered man returning to haunt the pub. The Salters Gate Inn is now closed, and hence we must wonder whether the residents of the flats that replace it will be haunted by this character. In some parts of the Pacific Islands, people would place a small statue of an old woman on their hearth. This was the hearth mother, and her presence was said to protect the fire and stop it from going out. As I said earlier, the hearth is the centre of the old home, and so an important place for both daily living and for traditional magical practice. As one of the four cardinal elements, fire is often incorporated into magical workings and rituals. For some, it is a purifying energy and is connected to strong will. We have already seen how fire can both create and destroy, and so, by extension of that, in magical practices it is believed to both heal and harm. As with the native stories at the start of this show, fire can bring about new life and purge that which needs to go. In many cultures, 
fire relates to magical superstitions and customs as well as to more practical charms or rituals. In some areas of England, fire was used for divinatory practices, with the shape of embers which jumped from the hearth being used to predict events such as births or deaths, or the arrival of important visitors. In America, instead of throwing spilt salt over your shoulder, you should cast it into the fire, where it will dry up the tears that would otherwise be shed. In areas of both America and Canada, it is generally thought to be bad luck to dream of fire. It may portend sickness, trouble within the family such as a row or anger of some kind. In other areas, whereas it is a sign of trouble to dream of smoke, dreaming of fire may lead to unexpected money. You never can tell with dreams. As with most aspects of folklore, the devil is connected with tales relating to fire, aside from the expected ones relating to hell and purgatory, of course. In some parts of Europe, the inability to coax a fire to draw properly is blamed on the devil being in close proximity. In other places, it is said that you should not toss bread crusts into the fire, as this may attract the devil. It is unclear why the act of essentially creating toast should bring Satan into your home. Possibly this story emerges from a folk tale to teach against wastefulness of food. Folklore is often used as a teaching aid. Sometimes this is in the form of morality tales. Sometimes it can be as a way of protecting people from harm. And sometimes it can be as a mechanism to stop children from doing things that you do not want them to do. In Japan, for example, children may be told that to play with fire will turn them into bedwetters. This is certainly a good way to prevent them from being burned. With so much folklore and custom surrounding it, it should not be surprising that fire plays a big part in so many festivals or calendar customs. We cannot possibly look at the whole range of these, but we can highlight a small number. Probably one of the most well-known of the British calendrical celebrations is that of Bonfire Night, or Guy Fawkes Night, on November the 5th. Fawkes was a 17th century revolutionary who, with a band of others, planned to blow up the seat of government in London by placing casks of gunpowder under the Palace of Westminster. The plot was foiled in time, and the building is still one of the most iconic in the capital. Londoners should probably be thankful that the plan did fail, as it's recently been calculated that Fawkes severely overestimated the amount of gunpowder needed, and would, in fact, most likely have destroyed an area of some ten miles radius, with an explosion that would have had the power of a low-level nuclear device. The nursery rhyme that accompanies this tradition is not well remembered these days past the opening. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. Although the original actually runs to multiple verses. Traditionally, along with firework displays, bonfires are lit in large public events. An effigy is burned atop the fire. Customarily, this should represent Guy Fawkes though in modern times the custom has developed with the fluidity that folk tradition often enjoys. Politicians and unpopular celebrities are all fair game for having effigies burned in more modern times. On the same night, in Ottery St Mary in Devon, incidentally the village on which J.K. Rowling based Ottery St Catchpole in the Harry Potter series, we find the tradition of rolling or carrying flaming tar barrels through the village. A massively popular event, thousands flock to witness the spectacle, which almost died out recently due to the excessive insurance premiums over health and safety concerns. The festival now has to be insured overseas in order to continue in its current form. In many accounts, people describe the barrels as being rolled, but in fact they are carried on the shoulders of the carriers, who wear thick hessian mittens to prevent injuries from burning. The festivities start in the afternoon with junior barrels, and continue through the evening with the adult barrels, which increase in size as time passes. Each wooden barrel, which is coated in tar and lit at one end, is carried and passed from person to person until it collapses.
barrels are run directly through the crowds of onlookers who must move quickly to avoid being caught in the stampede. To witness this first hand is, I assure you from personal experience, quite something. In County Meath, Ireland, is the Hill of Ward. In Irish, this is Clachter, after the powerful druid in Irish mythology. This hill was traditionally a centre of religious ceremony, with Samhain and Day of Dead celebrations taking place there. The top of the hill was considered sacred ground. Places would be set for deceased kinsfolk to visit, as well as offerings being placed for the fey folk. Recent archaeological excavation has uncovered traces of incense being burned here, whose dating suggests Samhain celebrations being important here back into the first millennium. In recent times, Celtic fire festivals have been revived on this site and may be attended on October the 31st. One piece of caution must be exercised when looking at these sorts of festivals. Many resources on the internet and elsewhere suggest that fire festivals around Halloween in Britain are connected with the ritual burning of witches. This is a sweeping statement that requires more thought before it is cited. People accused of practising witchcraft, which is quite different from witches, were burned in Scotland and in Europe, but not in England. So festivals such as that at Ottery St Mary would not have their roots here. Fire has had a vital role to play in the survival of mankind since the early periods of human habitation on this planet. It may create, nurture and destroy with equal ease and its powers may be harnessed in all of these ways. Fire appears in legends across many cultures. Prometheus stole fire from the gods to promote the advancement of mankind. Grandmother Spider, in Cherokee tradition, stole it from the sun so that man may be seen in the dark. Fire may be chaotic, being often connected with Loki, the Norse god of that trait, or the Roman Vulcan, the god of metalworking. However you look at it, Fire truly burns brightly in the hearth of folklore. The next edition of the Folklore Podcast, which releases on the 15th of the month, will be a guest show, so I'll be joined by another folklore researcher to discuss their work. If you want to find out in advance who the guests are and what subjects we discuss, then please sign up for our free newsletter at www.thefolklorepodcast.com. All of our big news is announced there first. The newsletters come out on the first of the month. In the November newsletter, there are a couple of announcements about some big crossover interviews we're planning with shows in the States. More details about those soon. The usual episode e-magazine supplement for this show is available to download on our website. Remember that all of our patrons, from a mere one dollar a month upwards, receive all of our e-magazines as soon as they're released. If you love what we do, then please consider signing up to give us a little support to keep the podcast going. www.patreon.com slash the folklore podcast to do that. Or, if it isn't something that you can do, then please consider leaving us a good review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. These put us into the charts and help us to keep the audience growing, securing the future of the show. This month, we heard from Lee Beat and his family in the UK, who got in touch with us just to say how much they were enjoying the show. Hello, Lee and family. We're really pleased you like the podcasts. Other people have messaged us with interesting video links or articles, or to discuss the themes of the show, and we thank all of them. We love to hear from our audience. It helps us to engage, educate, and improve the show. Please message us 
on the Folklore Podcast Facebook page or email using the contact form on our website. We'd love to chat to you. Send in your stories, folklore experiences, or just say hi. And while you're doing so, please share our posts and the website on your social media and bring more people along. The bigger our audience gets, the more we can do. Thanks for listening. See you next time.